Kenya is one of the seven, only seven countries that have managed to meet the 2020 and 2022 targets uh, with a baseline of uh, 2015 of, of reducing new infections and redu reducing TB-related mortality. First of all, TB being a very highly stigmatized disease, stigma and discrimination is such a barrier to access, even where services are available. We can, we can deploy more friendly and um, accessible technology, for example, portable X-ray machines. Right now we have some digital portable X-ray machines, which we have not yet exhausted that. We still have not rolled out at the, at the country level. Yet they are there, they have been approved, but we have not invested in that. But we have been currently been having challenges of stock out of cartridges for gene expert, which has made us uh, fall back to the old microscopy, which we all know that the, the efficacy um, the efficacy levels are, are quite low and that it, they're not able to, to diagnose or to tell drug resistance. So the, the government has tried to um, procure uh, gene expert cartridges, uh, machines which are not adequate. And I do not want to use the word adequate in terms of numbers. It's inadequacy of accessibility in that you can have one or two gene expert machines in a very vast county. So the sample networking uh, issue is a problem. And so uh, the introduction of CRUNAT that is, that, that is mobile, that, is, that, that, can be, that can be used at a point of care, that would be the most highly recommended. I mentioned before, we have suffered the issue of stock out of the, the cartridges for quite a long time, I think for over a year now. And this can be addressed by having um, the, the, the more improved technology like, like the TrueNAT and be distributed across uh, all the counties to ensure that every person who needs the diagnosis can access it with a lot of this. Like we need to stop everything we are doing and ensure that it has come to do what it was meant to be. Like so much investment has been put in this technology. So welcome friends. Today we have a very special guest amongst us, an old friend and a powerful, fierce, passionate advocate to NTB. Uh, before I introduce you to her, uh, let me let me share that, you know, we, we have just passed the midpoint since our, all the governments in the world committed to NTB. Over 90 months have passed by, 90 months are left to 2030, but the TB rates have not really dipped by 50% or half. When we say TB is preventable, it is not preventable for over 10.6 million people who get uh, got TB um, in 2021 as per the Global TB Report. So today we have Evelyn Kibuchi amongst us, who uh, is the National uh, Chief Coordinator of the Stop TB Partnership in Kenya. And for as long as we have known her for so many years, she has been a very fierce human rights advocate for uh, ending tuberculosis and making sure that health responses are community-centric and people-centric. Before we um, ask her to speak, I would like to share uh, what she said to us in um, 10 years back in 2013. So, so Evelyn had said to us, the Ministry of Health needs to increase contact tracing for adults with TB. It is the best way for the children who have been exposed and it is not happening. And let us listen insights from the fierce and powerful Evelyn Kibuchi. Evelyn, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Bobby. And quite excited. Thanks, Evelyn. Some subjects again. Thank you. So Evelyn, uh, please, please uh, let us know uh, um, where are we right now in terms of ending TB in, uh, in Kenya? And also you can speak about globally as you are such a Peers advocate for uh, NTB, and you have that context. So, are uh, are we are we really uh, anywhere near the track where we should have been? Over to you. Thank you so much, Bobby. And allow me to pick from where I left 2013. That's about 10 years ago, and briefly talk about what has happened and what have we done differently. Uh, two things have happened at the global level. One of them is what I would call political commitments. 
Back in 2018, one of the biggest gaps that we were fighting against was low political commitment towards tuberculosis. As we are talking now, in a few days to come, we are going to be attending the second high-level meeting on tuberculosis that is going to bring together heads of states from different countries to come and deliberate one agenda, how to end TB by the year 2030. That's a great, great leap that has been lacking all through. And we are hoping that if we keep the momentum of the political commitment, then we might meet the target of ending TB by 2030. With political commitment, then we see more funding, we see more new technologies, we see more commitment into research and development. And that's what we have all been looking for. So at a global level, I would say quite a lot has been happening. In my country, Kenya, a lot also has been happening and good news to talk about. First of all, we, Kenya is one of the seven, only seven countries that have managed to meet the 2020 and 2022 targets uh, with a baseline of uh, 2015 of, of reducing new infections and redu reducing TB-related mortalities. Uh, to bring this into perspective, uh, in 2019 alone, the country lost 33,000 people, but that has come down to about 21,000 in 2021. That's a huge, huge reduction. And what can we attribute to these um, changes? One, like I mentioned, is political commitments. With the establishment of parliamentary TB caucuses, where parliamentarians now sit down to deliberate on how they can contribute to TB through um, advocacy, increasing investments at the country level. That has been a great game changer. And the second one, and the very important one, is community engagement. Kenya in 2018 established what we call the network of TB champions. These are people who have had TB experiences, lived experiences, and are willing to use the experiences for two things. One, for advocacy, and two, to engage in community-based activities that have um, tremendously contributed to the, to, the, to the successes that I've mentioned. Of course, the others are the new technologies, for example, improved, um, we have the child-friendly, pediatric, pediatric-friendly treatments. We have better diagnosis, improved diagnosis. So all these combines have seen a great improvement at the country level. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Evelyn. And the and uh, when you were talking about uh, pediatric friendly or child friendly treatments, it reminded me Kenya was the first country in the world, I think, which had begun the rollout of child friendly treatments when they find when when they became available from the science, right? If, if true, I, true. In twenty sixteen, yes. yes. And also, it is in a way very sad that uh, the world forgot the children in TB response. And it's only in the recently in the last 10, 15 years because of people like you that uh, children, uh, childhood TB also is getting its due attention. And now the data is also coming up. And of course, we have child-friendly TB medic medications. Uh, are, um, are people being able to access TB diagnosis? And is it happening? And what are we, how are we diagnosing TB? Are we using sputum microscopy, which is uh, less efficient, and uh, some people may uh, not not get diagnosed from tools like uh, one forty year old sputum microscopy? Are we really deploying molecular tests? Is uh, like WHO says every presumptive person with presumptive TB should get molecular tests. So, uh, so over to you to hear your insights on how can we early and accurately diagnose people with TB. So, and of course, it diagnoses an entry point to a care pathway. So, so that is why also it, is, it becomes so much more important. So, Thank you. I'll talk about success and look at it in different perspectives. I'll talk about social barriers to access. I'll talk about technology barriers to access. And I'll talk about cost barriers to access. First of all, TB being a very highly stigmatized disease, stigma and discrimination is such a barrier to access, even where services are available because of the fear that when I go and I, I am diagnosed with tuberculosis, people will conclude that I have TB. Others fear they will lose their jobs. We have seen cases of people being um, losing their jobs because of tuberculosis 
I've seen children being sent away from school because of tuberculosis. So such discrimination and human rights violation are huge barriers to access. The second barrier is that of cost. You see, we keep uh, selling the narrative that TB, TB treatment is free, but it's only free after diagnosis. Before diagnosis, you're not identified as a TB patient. Therefore, you are, you, you, you are subject to all the costs that come with diagnosis of, of, of diseases. So um, that has been such a barrier because before you are diagnosed with T, that is TB, you have undergone quite a number of tests, which come at a cost. For example, uh, if you go uh, with a cough, first of all, they may think it's, it's COVID and you pay for that COVID test. They will think it's pneumonia. You pay for that pneumonia test. They will think it's asthma and you pay for that. You may go for five tests because you, before you finally um, concluded to be a TB patient, all those diagnoses come at a cost, which many people cannot afford. That's a big challenge. And now I talk about uh, uh, the access, uh, the, the challenge of access because of um, affordability, okay, not affordability, but um, the, the availability. I come from a country where we have uh, some far-flung counties where um, healthcare facilities are not available. Uh, if they're available, they, they, they're, quite, they're quite far. And so, so that becomes a challenge that uh, bars many from accessing um, the, the diagnosis. However, there are some solutions that are available, but probably we have not exhausted them. For example, where we have far-flung uh, services, we can, we can deploy more friendly and um, accessible technology. For example, portable, X-ray machines. Right now, we have some digital portable X-ray machines, which we have not yet exhausted. That we still have not rolled out at the at the country level. Yet they are there. They have been approved, but we have not invested in that. You mentioned about. You asked me about uh, access to diagnosis. In my country, yes, uh, WHO. We are using the WHO recommended and approved uh, molecular tests. That is a gene expert. However, we have been currently been having challenges of stock out of cartridges for gene experts, which has made us uh, fall back to the old microscopy, which we all know that the, the, efficacy, um, the efficacy levels are, are quite low and that if they're not able to, to diagnose or to tell drug resistance. So that, that becomes a challenge in diagnosing um, or identify drug resistance uh, tuberculosis. And this may often go untreated because of using old technology. So um, at my, in, the, in the country, we are still struggling with having high numbers of people who have not been diagnosed with TB. Um, yeah, they're just uh, mixing with other people because they have not been diagnosed. We have a, just about 50% of people who are diagnosed, meaning we have about 50% who are that, who are not who have not been identified again because of those barriers I've, that I've mentioned about. But I've, I want to mention one very important one: awareness. Bobby, if I if I if I am sick, and I know where I am sick, I would not sit down in the house to suffer. But because we have not created awareness like we did for COVID. People are suffering with TB, but they do not know that the symptoms that they are going through is, is, is tuberculosis. Therefore, they are not going for treatment. So I would say, even as we invest in new technology, in vaccines, if you're not investing in awareness, then we are wasting all other interventions. And thanks a lot for, you know, for the, the, for the way you mentioned about uh, social uh, barriers, about technological barriers, about financial barriers. I think it is so clear and it is so powerfully articulated. To, to, so really thanks a lot for that. The stigma still lurks and it is such a huge barrier even today. So in India, for example, uh, so 23% of the people with presumptive TB, almost one in more than one in five, get molecular tests. So uh, for all the molecular tests, the most used molecular test is TrueNet, which is a point of care and decentralized. So it so so th this is a very big uh, help in terms of making it more accessible 
at primary healthcare level. So, so back to you to hear your insights. On this. Yeah, first I want to acknowledge the improvement or the the progress that has been made has been made in that direction of um, accessing molecular tests. Like you mentioned from the beginning, I've been in this game for quite a long time. I came to TB, um, the TB sector, when at the country level we had centralized um, centralized services, especially for drug resistant TB. I remember patients had to relocate to the city, that is to the capital city of Kenya called Nairobi, from their from their, their homes that are up to 300 kilometers away come look for accommodation in the city so that they can access treatment. And they, they had other conditions. For example, you had to show a deposit of a minimum amount of uh, dollars in your account to prove that you are able to sustain yourself in Nairobi. And you also had to come with somebody who was going to support you in accessing that treatment. All this has changed now. We have decentralized um, health services and almost every county has a, um, a TB treatment center and a TB diagnosis center. So yeah, that said, it, we still have the challenges. First, um, you talked about um, access to um, the, the gene experts. Yeah, we have, the country has, the, the government has tried to, um, procure uh, gene expert cartridges, uh, machines, which are not adequate. And I do not want to use the word adequate in terms of numbers. It's inadequacy of accessibility in that you can have one or two gene expert machines in a very vast county. So the sample networking uh, issue is a problem where um, obtaining samples from far-flung uh, facilities uh, that have to be transported sometimes by public means without the proper uh, mm -hmm. transportation equipment to ensure, the, 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 to ensure that the, the sample is still safe by the time it gets to the center, the gene expert center, that has become a challenge. And so uh, the introduction of CRUNAT that is that is mobile. That is that that can be that can be used at a point of care. That would be the most highly recommended. However, we still have that gap. We have not rolled out TrueNAT um, to the entire the entire country. At least to complement the gene expert or to seal the gaps that come with the gene expert uh, machine. Uh, like I have mentioned before, we have suffered the issue of stock out of the the cartridges for quite. A long time, I think, for over a year now, and this can be addressed by having um, the, the the more improved technology, like like the TrueNAT, and be distributed across uh, all the counties to ensure that every person who needs the diagnosis can access it with a lot of ease. Yes, thanks. Uh, uh, so, uh, literally, amen to what you just said. Let us hope that uh, the TB testing reaches everyone who needs it. The main point is that, the, that we need to have the best of testing, reach out to the people, especially those who are unable or find it difficult to come to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the testing facilities. So Evelyn, um, uh, I would like to know that what, what is, uh, to what extent has Kenya and other countries progressed on 146 treatment regime? You know? Yeah, first of all, I really want to appreciate the researchers and whoever has been putting research for these new improved technologies, including the treatments. However, there has been challenges in uh, the speed at which countries adopt this new technology, which is quite disturbing because if we have better improved treatment somewhere and I cannot access it for whatever the reason, mm. to me, I, I would look at it as a, um, the variation of rights, because we should do whatever is humanly possible to quickly ensure that patients get the most improved, comfortable, efficiency, afford accessible, you know, a treatment that is available. Mm -hmm. Anyway, having said that, at the country level, we we have made strides, but we have not we have not uh, 
adopted the, the newest technology that there is. For example, we have been able to adopt the injectable free MDRTB treatment. But, and of course, we, we were able to eliminate the category two of the, 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 the reinfection for TB treatment. But we are still using the six months treatment for the drug, uh, drug susceptible tuberculosis. And for MDR, we are still using the 18 months, uh, 18 months uh, treatment. The reason why we have not adopted the new ones, of course, they're not, we, we cannot justify them, but I'll just mm -hmm. mention them. One is that uh, we are still in the process of developing the guidelines and um, you know the, the framework, the policy framework for adopting this. And secondly, even when we adopt it, we need funding for that. Because more often than not, these technologies come in in the middle of a financial year. That means we did not budget for it in the beginning. And for the beginning, we rely heavily on donors to support that. And donor support cannot be fully, I mean, we cannot rely on that. So I will make two appeals. One, one, a technology, a new commodity, a new treatment is available. Like we need to stop everything we are doing and ensure that it has come to do what it was meant to be. Like so much investment has been put in this technology. And we, somebody or, or a policy stands in between a patient and accessing that treatment, I would say, I would, I would say it's almost immoral and we need to work on that. Secondly, countries need to own the TB response and have um, some reserves for, you know, to, to be used in the event that the country gets a new, the new technology in place so that we are able to roll it out as fast as possible with no barriers. As for TB prevention therapy, yes, we, had, we have adopted the, the 3HP, though we have not rolled it out at uh, uh, 100%, we are still uh, doing it in small scales and uh, scaling up in a, in, a, in a bit slow pace, I would say, but we are hoping uh, we, we, in the next few years, we should be able to roll it out 100% at the country level. We are right now at about 30% in coverage of the the. the the TB prevention therapy. This is so important, uh, even in the 30% coverage of the TB preventive therapy. And let us hope that the new regimens also reach those who need it. So, uh, so even in, well, I know uh, we're taking too much of your time, but before we uh, let you do your important work, uh, can you share uh, your call for the UN UNHLM uh, world leaders who will be there next month along with you? and um, any other issue which you would like to uh, raise or put here? Over to you. Thank you so much. My call to the leaders, my first and very important one, is a TB vaccine. The lessons we have learned from COVID is that we can invest in all public health interventions, but the magic bullet remains a vaccine. We learned that from COVID, we put all the public health measures, we invested in... Um, masks, um, uh, um, what we're calling uh, the travel bans, curfews, but all that, they, it helped, but to a very small extent, the magic bullet was a vaccine. So I am calling on the leaders that, um, they, that they make a commitment to make investment in research and development adequate enough to give the world an effective, affordable, efficient, and accessible vaccine. And when it comes out, there should be what I would call equity in its distribution and its access, that anybody who needs it is a priority. We have learned our good lessons from COVID. The second one is, to the leaders, ending TB is a reality, it is possible. If we are able to end, almost end COVID, in a period of about two years, we can surely end uh, TB. All what is needed is increased political commitment, increased investment in TB, and most importantly, engaging communities who are the ones in touch with the people who are suffering 
from this disease. Stage. You're so right that people need to be center stage. The, all the programs, it's, you know, in India, we say of the people, by the people, for the people, that is what democracy should be. But the health responses should be like that too. And that is very, very important and central. And COVID has shown us that um, economic economy and businesses and trade, nothing can survive unless we have health security for each one of us. So thanks a lot, Evening, again for your time and insights. Um, it's really always very inspiring and personally very, uh, you know, uh, stimulating for me to listen to your, to your insights. So, so thanks a lot for that. And we really hope that uh, your powerful advocacy is at its very best when we need it most at the next month's UNHLM. All the best, uh, Evelyn, and uh, my regards to Stop Tree Partnership, Kenya, and all your team. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Bobby, and bye.